while he's getting set up. Everybody introduce. Okay, so let's get started by everybody introducing themselves while Fallon gets started, gets everything set up. And we'll start over here on our left. David Barrett, Appalachian Independent Center. Okay. I'm Carrie Holt, I'm the CEO of the Southwest Virginia Association of Realtors. Okay. I'm Carrie Holt. Sandy Ratliff, I'm with Virginia Community Capital, and I'm the one running the streaming today. She's our partner in education. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready? Okay, so today we are excited to have Fallon Gray. Uh, Fallon's going to talk to us about customer service. Fallon is, well, I'll let him tell you all about himself. Hey, I'm a graphic designer and software developer for KVAT, working over at Food City. And that's the long and the short of it. Uh, I play music and, and make art in my spare time. And now, every once in a while, I do some presentations and public speaking. And I guess that's about it. I'm a Virgo. <laughs> uh, let's see here. This PowerPoint, unfortunately, doesn't seem to want to cooperate. Let me try something else here. saying anything or doing anything that I can tell now. I tried to copy it to the desktop and open it from there. Maybe it'd be quicker than trying to load it from the flash drive. But it just stays on 89%. Let me see if I can kill it and start over. Big money, no whammy. seems to be responsive. I can't even open the task manager. <coughs> Thanks for being patient while we go through some technical difficulty. There's no running apps. It won't. Can you we can just shut it down, restart it. Maybe or just yeah, this may work too. Let's go on. Thank you very much. Oh, I've got a, a decently updated version from the one that I sent you an email. I've still been working on it since I sent that to you. Um, I'll try to restart this. Just see if that with this since we're live. You can get started. Yeah. So, we've probably all been there, right? Anybody here? That doesn't work to advance the slide. Okay. <laughs> I'll just do it manually. All right. That sounds good. Has anybody here not had a poor customer experience? You ever call somebody on the phone and have to wait through 700 menus and still never get to a person. So yeah, that, that kind of sucks. Uh, customer service is, is one way to look at it. I think customer experience is a much better way to think about it because everybody needs service. You go to a restaurant, somebody gives you your food and says, bon appetit, that's service. That's what you expect, that's what you should get. You're paying for something. But an experience can be good, it can be bad. And so if it's better than you expect, then hey, you're gonna have a positive taste in your mouth after that experience. No pun intended with the restaurant reference there. So hopefully by the end of our interaction today, 
you guys can maybe have some new techniques and ideas that you can employ when talking to customers or even other uh, colleagues or just people in general that can help just ease the way to get to wherever you want to be with, with any particular goal that you have when talking to people. So I think it's a missed opportunity for a lot of people. Brand building is what customer service is all about. It's like you've got customer service even if you don't have a customer service department. Everybody has customer service. It's just built into it. Even if it's just the grocery store checkout clerk smiling at you and actually being interested in how you're doing right now in your day. So every moment of every interaction with any customer, no matter who it is and on what level, is, is part of that customer's experience and it's part of their support, it's part of what they're going to take away with them. So why in the world would anybody not want that to be as positive as it could possibly be? So what is it? Customer experience is it's the feelings and thoughts that the people associate with your brand. So it is what they come away with. It's not just the service or product, it's you. It's the company, it's the brand, it's the feelings that they have about all of that. So when they interact with you and your brand and anything else, definitely if you have a product that isn't holding up consistently, then you've got to work on your uh, quality control department. That's one thing. But dealing with that in the meantime until you get that fixed is a huge deal, and it's going to determine whether or not you lose a whole lot of client base or go under altogether. So it's really important. And yeah, the highs and the lows too. So if you have good customer experiences, but then you offset that with negative, that influences and people are fickle. You know, we all are, I am too. We're influenced by everything that we experience all the time. And the opposite is true, is the good news too. You can have a decent bit of bad experience and if you're still with somebody, you better take advantage if somebody's still with you and, and try to, your best to, to do something to keep them with you. And it's everything. It's, it's all of your senses. It really is an emotional experience to interact with another person. Even if it doesn't seem like it, even if you're not thinking of it in that way, that is happening at all times. So it's, it's something to really think about and, and pay attention to. So why does it matter? Well, today, especially today, there are less and less ways to set yourself apart as a business or just a, a person interacting with other people, but especially with businesses. So. Uh, studies are showing that people are more and more feeling like customer service is a make it or break it factor for them, especially since prices are becoming more competitive. Uh, people with internet, uh, you know, you can now avoid paying taxes in a lot of situations. So there's lots of presence out there, lots of competitors, and you really want to set yourself apart. And this is an easy, quick way to do it. And again, we talked about price just now. Uh, location used to be a way that you could have a competitive advantage. Location, location, location. We've all heard that, and that absolutely is still true to some degree, but it's less important than it used to be because of the Internet and how that's changing the way a lot of us do business. Like, I love Chewy.com. That place is awesome. I order online from there all the time. They're super quick. They get it right. They even sent my pets a birthday card. That's pretty neat. That's great customer service. And your product itself, well now you've got a billion products, no matter what you're into, somebody else is probably already doing it. It's extremely difficult to come up with a new product or, or even sell it in really a different way significantly. So all these things that used to be a way that you could kind of fudge things around and, and make some impact are less than they used to be. So. Bad news travels fast, we know that. If we have a bad experience, we're much more likely to want to vent that to our friends and our family and speak about that. If you go and you have regular, or even just fine, absolutely fine, good service, that's normal, that's what you should expect. So nobody's really gonna talk about that. I don't tell everybody about the hot dog I had yesterday because it was just fine. There was nothing great, there was nothing bad about it. It was, it was good service. But if I have something memorable, if somebody did something that stayed with me, whatever it was, then there's a story I get to tell when something like that comes up in conversation. Whether it be hot dogs, whether it be customer service, whether it be what's the best thing that's happened to you this week, well, that'll be in my bank of things that I remember because it's out of the ordinary. Somebody was really excellent to me personally when they sold me something as simple as a hot dog. So there's been a lot of studies done and because it's all about the bottom line so there's 
always be in studies done, of course. And that being said, statistics and stuff can be skewed a little bit. It depends on who's doing it, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, what their motives are in presenting those figures to you. But these are a good benchmark. If they're not exactly right on, they're, they're a good indicator. So it seems with a lot of customers being polled that roughly 57% of them still right now with, with whatever changes have been going on with the internet and other things, feel like they can't get a hold of somebody when they want to or need to. They either have to wade through a million menus or just simply nobody answers or you don't even have menus, you just can't get through to somebody. So that is a real sticking point, obviously, for the majority of people. That's one of the most sore points. The next thing is, is even when you finally get a hold of somebody, the service process itself can be really slow, really cumbersome. 42% uh, of people seem to think that, man, I have to talk to too many people. It's like I followed the menus. I should be with the person in billing that I need to talk to. But they're like, oh, well, your problem's specific. I need to transfer you to somebody else. And then you find out, oh, sorry, I need to transfer you. And so, that's a real pain in the butt. 34% uh, feel like kind of like a number, like people just really don't care all that much. That it's not personal, that you don't care about me and my problem. I'm just another person on the phone that you want to just shuffle through the system. And 24%, a quarter, like one out of every four people feels like whoever they're talking to on the phone, it's like I know more than this person does. And I've been there. I've been there at Best Buy. I go in there and I'm like, oh, this joker does not know what he's talking about and I'm aware of it. I know more than he does. And that's not a good feeling to have when you're looking for information that you don't already have. And 16%, this will probably grow in the next several years because this is people who feel that there's either poor website design, poor experience on the internet, or just lack of product availability on the internet. I have to go to the store, I have to make a call or something. The whole point with the internet is it's supposed to be quicker, more accessible, easier for me. So that's a sticking point for a lot of people. So there's a lot of dissatisfaction. Specifically, all of this goes around customer experience. And so these are all fantastic aspects of the same broad umbrella that we can take advantage of to make ourselves stick out from the pack. And why in the world would we not? Because it's so quick and easy. You can do it every minute of every day. It's just simply adopting an attitude and, and throwing in a few spicy words just to make it personal for a person. So, 89%, this to me is insane, but it makes sense. 89% of people, give or take, stop, completely just abandon you and go away from your company with bad experience and they're doing it earlier and quicker and easier. So it's like at the first sign of difficulty, you've got so much competition, so much availability on the internet for whatever product or service you're looking for, it's a lot easier to just search just a little bit more with Google or make a phone call to your friend, see what they recommend on Facebook, go to Yelp, Angie's List, all this stuff and just leave this company alone if they're not going to at least try to treat you really well right out of the gate. So if you get the feeling that they're not really even trying, they just jump ship really quickly and that's not going to get any better with the way technology works these days. And a lot of people don't just get upset, I mean they get upset, they do get upset and they don't just get upset and they don't just tell their friends and other people that they know, they, they feel personal, it feels personal, you know, if you feel like you chose a company and you're willing to invest your time and your money trying to get something meaningful to you from them and they don't seem to really care it maybe feels personal to a lot of people and that's on the increase okay now this was a study done in the UK 38 million people in just the year 2014 and that's that long ago this number has probably increased since then um, made a complaint that's an average of 1.2 complaints every second of every day for an entire year that's a lot of complaints so the the point is not necessarily that we're all complainers or the companies are necessarily doing horrendous jobs but there's that much customer interaction just through the customer support funnel so there's a lot of interaction a lot of people needing something wanting something needing some kind of support and service so why in the world not make that if you can just make it two percent better than it is now then two percent of 38 million is a lot more happy customers than they were before so every little bit you can do to increase customer support why in the world wouldn't you, especially if it's easy and cost effective? And it is because you've already got employees, you're already paying their salary. So just instill that idea and that culture into your employees that, hey, 
the customers, our lifeblood, if you don't treat them right, if they don't want to be with us, you don't have a job anymore. A company goes under. So, And even beyond that, it's just a sense of pride for a lot of people. Why wouldn't you want to be happy and excited about being able to and having the opportunity to make people around you happier and make their day better than it was before they called in to talk to you? So, And with social media and the Internet, it's only going to get more and more thorough because now people have the opportunity with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and whatever else and to just go out there and be like, man, these jokers, I don't really care for them. And reviews influence all, us all very much. If I'm wanting to buy a printer and I go on Amazon and this one has five star rating or a 4.7 average rating out of a thousand reviews, I'm going to trust that a whole lot more than one that's got 15, 16, or a thousand reviews at 1.5 stars. I'm absolutely going to trust that. It's social proof. You know, these, this many people can't all simultaneously accidentally be dumb and wrong. The likelihood is, and I'm influenced by that. We all are influenced that, by that. And 20 million people, this is that same year, that 2014, when that 38 million people complained, 20 million of them did that through consistently through all these social media outlets. And again, everything's going to the cell phone. It's already almost completely supplanted you know, the way that people interact online compared to desktop PCs. Most people have the phone or the tablet and that's what they're going to use. It's portable, it's easy, it's powerful. So it's going to keep going this direction. The good news, so I've ta talked a lot about all the pitfalls that a lot of us experience and have to watch out for. One of the great things about it is, again, it gives us great opportunity to be proactive instead of reactive. Instead of waiting for somebody to call with a problem, every time somebody comes into your store to buy a phone charger for their Motorola or whatever it is, enhance their experience. They're already there in front of you. Make sure that they're happy before they even walk out of the building and make sure that they have whatever they need to be confident that if they do have a problem that they will be able to contact you, that you're going to be here and that you're going to care about them in that case. Hopefully it won't be, but you can be proactive and that's very helpful. One neat thing about that too is that it really instills a sense of not only loyalty but of a personal good feeling towards your brand and you personally if you're the one interacting with them. So people that just have a good feeling about a company and trust in them are more likely to buy even if they don't need to buy or if they didn't think about it or intend to and they'll be a lot more likely to recommend it. It's just a more confident and trust issue when you have good experiences and believe in whoever it is you're talking to. And the great thing about that is, and I kind of said this a minute ago, when people have really bad experiences, they're really going to make some noise and they're going to tell people and that's no good. Good service is the expectation. So you've got to at least be decent. You've got to do what you're supposed to do and follow all your promises. And even if you're not making promises, whatever you know and you need to study if you don't know what the customer expects and meet those expectations at a bare minimum. But if you can just throw in a little bit of personalization, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of whatever, tailor it to your own personality, be genuine, and add that, and then they're going to start talking a little bit more too. And that is invaluable because now you're not paying these people at all. That's a very cost-effective way because it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot less expensive to retain customers than it is to go out and get them by way of commercials and advertising and all the expense we put into getting customers. So keeping them is good. And enlisting the help of the ones that you already do have through customer service and a great experience to go out and get their family and friends to come to you too because they really enjoy their experience with you is invaluable because then you're getting free advertisement and free people coming to you that you can then keep through your great customer service. So what do customers value? And this varies pretty widely depending on what your service is, depending on, on what your product is. But one thing that doesn't change a whole lot, there's some core things that people look for. One is just being treated like a person, you know, just be friendly to me, be kind, be courteous, I'm here, you know, like I'm paying your salary basically. It's like without us customers, your business isn't going to flourish. So just at least be nice to us. Uh, yeah, and being able to find stuff. And this goes back to that 16% that were dissatisfied with the website design and things like that. If it loads too slowly, if it's just too hard to find what you're looking for, make the most common things that you know people would be looking for. Make your contact. Like I used to uh, 
design websites. And one thing that I was a stickler for is I wanted my phone number or the whoever, my client's phone number, to always be not only in the same spot, but on every page, no matter where you're at on that website, you're going to see the shopping cart and the contact phone number right up in the top hand right corner. Be able to log in, change your settings, just all this stuff that you'll do often or need to have ready whenever you want it is always visible and available. So that's just good support and good design. Personalized experiences, that just kind of makes sense. We've already talked about that. That's just, you know, rapport, basically. You know, shoot the breeze about the weather for a minute if you want to. Give a sincere compliment. That's a great thing. You've got to kind of be careful with that sometimes, you know, what you compliment and how you do it. But that's just common sense. It should be. And good reputation. That's what this all is building towards, really, is, is uh, building your brand, building your reputation, your trust with your clients. Just do good things, be good, be sincere, pay attention to what you're doing, and honestly care about your customers and how they feel and what experience they're going through. Put your eyes in their eyes and look at what you're doing and think about how you would feel if you were in their situation. And that will build a great reputation and that'll build loyalty and income. So, Bob Farrell, this guy's kind of neat. Um, he is a character and he used to have these ice cream shops. And they sold burgers and stuff too, but it was mainly known for the ice cream. And he got a call from a customer, and he took the call, and he, he's very thankful, and he talks about it still, that the customer called in and said, okay, I had a bad experience at your company. And it's like, all I wanted was a pickle. You know, I wanted extra pickle. And the, the person said, well, that's against our policy. I'm going to have to charge you 75 cents for the pickle. So the guy was like, to himself, I don't think he made a big scene, but he just left and he's like, this is ridiculous. I'm not paying 75 cents for a pickle. You can't just give me one. So he calls and complains to the owner. And Bob says, oh, goodness, you know, I'm so sorry for that. I mean, that's crazy. Come on back. Absolutely. We don't have that policy. I'll take care of that. You have as many pickles as you want. He said, I sent him a coupon, you know, and then talked to him and everything was great. And the guy was happy and satisfied. He did come back and he was super pleased that Bob responded in this way. And so Bob was super thankful because he's like, okay, that's a crazy experience. That should never happen. So now that's become our war cry for my entire company everywhere across the board. It's like, man, if somebody needs something, give them the pickle. Like, give them the pickle. Find out what your customers want and give it to them, especially if it's no skin off your back. Customers don't care about your policies, and the policies don't need to be so strict if they're going to cost you a customer. That's ridiculous. Suck it up and give them a pickle that you paid probably three cents for in bulk, you know. So that was really good. And he was talking about this, at, you know, kind of like I'm talking to you guys today. And a truck driver, a garbage truck driver, approached him after. And he says, yeah, yeah, we give away pickles too, man. I really relate to what you're saying. And then Bob's like, garbage truck? Pickles, this guy's kind of weird. He's kind of far out there. He's like, what do you mean? And the guy says, well, we sell lawnmowers, me and my son. And any time we're out in town, wherever we're at, it doesn't matter. Even if we're on vacation three states away, if we see somebody in their yard struggling and trying to get that lawnmower started, we pull over immediately and we go over there and we start that thing for them. And it's as simple as that because we can start any lawnmower. We are the boss. And so that's what they do, and that's their pickle. And Bob's like, yeah, that's your pickle. That totally makes sense. So that's an easy way, too, if you can come up with something that kind of sets you apart or, or come up with a slogan or an idea that can be your pickle, what is it specifically that you want to do for your customers that will make them remember what you're doing? And it could be as simple as, and, and I've had this ex positive experience a lot. This is really good when you ask where is something instead of saying it's down on aisle 17 on the right that's pretty good about halfway down that's good directions but if somebody takes the time to walk you there you feel good about it you feel like they really do care and they want to make sure you don't miss it or have to deal with it you know just take me and show me and that's really good and bob said a lot of people will do this and i have had this experience too when somebody ships me a product they will have a little handwritten note in there saying, thank you very much. You know, I hope this works really well for you. Something ridiculously simple, and somebody's packaging that stuff up. Just make a stamp if you have to. Send off. It only costs you probably about 12 bucks to have a stamp that looks handwritten, and just stamp that on every one of them if, if you really want to be cheap and quick about it. Whoops, let me go back there. Yeah, and include a menu instead of just giving them the food. Yeah, that way they can order what they want when they want.
Yeah, and I've got a. Let me see if this one's working now, because I do have a a bunch more actually. I think I restarted it, but and the screen was just up. time here. Does anybody have any comments or questions or anything to add while I'm trying to get this up real quick? I'm going to run and get Kathy super quick and see if she can put in that password for me. Kathy? Oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah. I was looking right at you a second ago. Here she is. <laughs> Thank you. What's some of the top three uh, customer service things that Food City encounters? I think one of the things that we tend to be most noted for is in our meat department. Just the people are really knowledgeable, really helpful, and they offer information. Even if you don't ask for it, they tell you about pairings, about the cuts. They're excited about what they do. They're proud of what they do, and they offer some of that information. And a lot of times, it helps people that wouldn't know the best way to get the juiciness in that pork loin. They're like, hey, if you're going to cook that in a crock pot, you might want to try this. And they may already know that, they may not, but even just somebody offering that information as a way to try to help you out, it feels good. So that's one really good thing that we're known for. Um, one thing we're known for is just community service in general, just being involved with the race and, and events and charity golf and giving to, to charities and raising money and donating and the care and the United Way and lots of other things like that. So we're really known for that, for involvement. And there was one other thing that I just had a second ago. It was all just Bakery Deli. Like uh, we always put ads in like the Dalton Tribune and lots of different newspaper all across lots of counties and, and all four states. And when we win Reader's Choice polls, we like to put an ad, in, we pay for an ad and put it in their newspaper and say, hey, thanks so much for voting us best deli and best produce. We really appreciate it. Now it's our turn. We vote you best customers. And so it's a little cheesy and corny, but hopefully it makes them feel good and let them know that not only do we appreciate them appreciating us, but we take the time and actually pay to let them know, hey, we noticed that. And thank you very much for doing that. I haven't pulled that, but. Okay. I can maybe pull that. USB out and put it back in. Oh, I see it's already on the desktop, yeah. Maybe. Hopefully. I don't know why it hung up a minute ago. Yeah, you'll have to move it from my iPad. You'll have to put the, put the projector up from my iPad. You need, to dump them. you need to take it off my iPad. Okay. Explore or anything. Crazy thing. Yeah, we're having a glitch. It's almost like the internet's not working. Yeah, nothing is. I couldn't, like, internet's nothing will load. <laughs> Can't do a thing with it. It's not clicking on it, it's not opening anything. This doesn't have a USB input on it, does it? And then we were saying, when someone doesn't have customer service, it's like, and we know how they're supposed to, you 
good deal. Yeah, and that's on one of the slides coming up, absolutely, the golden rule. Because, you know, if you know you'd feel good about an experience, then give that to your customer too, one rule. Would you not? I mean, even if you weren't worried about your bottom line, just because, why wouldn't you do it? Because you're going to feel better for having done it. They're going to feel better, and it's just a big love fest, and it's great. You know, just take advantage of opportunities to, to leave somebody better than you found them. It's easy. Everybody wins. Is the old saying, the customer is always right, still accurate? And if so, when they're not right, how do you make that feel like they are right? That's a great question. <laughs> that is a great one. And yes and no. <laughs> The customers definitely aren't always right, and some of them are belligerent, but most of them are not. And a lot of times, just depending on how you deliver the information, like one thing, uh, specifically, there was a guy, he went and had already had a reservation, and he called up and said, hey, can you transfer me into uh, a nicer suite? He wanted to upgrade to a nicer, nicer one. And the lady on the phone just said immediately, I'm sorry, there's none available. And he's like, well, hey, even if that's true, number one, at least make the effort. At least look, because things may have changed in the last 30 minutes or since you've looked last. So, A, check. And even if you are 99.9% .9 sure, even if you're 100% sure and you just looked four seconds ago, if you're not looking at it right this second, or even if you are, say, hey, I'd be delighted to do that for you. Let me see what we have available. Count to five and then say, I'm sorry, we're all booked up. We don't have that available. Is there something else that I can do for you? And see if he has any ideas about what he'd like to do instead of having that particular thing. Well, do you have like an ultra suite or the penthouse or another sister place, you know, a hotel that I can go down the street to that might have that for me? And then she can check that. So you never know, but at least pretend, at least make the effort. Look up and see instead of just saying no. So that's one good way. And if somebody calls in and they're mad, this is a, one of the biggest things. Sometimes people call in and they've already been transferred 14 times and they've gotten disconnected and had to wait 20 minutes to even begin to get transferred again. And man, that is rough. I've been there. And when you've been dealing with something for an hour and a half straight, you're losing your patience. I mean, the most patient and kind of us are losing our patience. So if somebody calls me on the phone and they're already mad, they're asking for my manager before I've even really finished saying hello, what can I do for you? I still say, because I don't want to go to the manager if it doesn't have to, and almost, it almost never needs to, because I can say something along the lines of, hey, you know, I hear what you're saying. Let them vent first. If they're already in a bad mood and they're venting, as long as they're not treating you as a punching bag personally, if they're making it personal and they're being really ugly to you, then that's just, you got to deal with that and that's a, a different topic. I mean, I can go a little bit into it, but it's basically you've got to be a little bit more stand up for yourself and say, you know, I'm sorry you're having a, a difficult time. And if they're trying to talk over you, just keep talking anyway and let them know. But, you know, this kind of, uh, the, the way you're speaking is, is not appropriate and I can't accept that. I want to help you. I'm here for you. But please, you know, and tell me. I want to hear what you're dealing with and what the problem is. But, you know, let's not be swearing at me and let's not be attacking me. Let me help you. What, what, what do you need? What can I do for you? And then hopefully, if you've said all of that, they've stopped trying to talk over you because they at some point become interested in your, because you're not giving in to them. So they usually will start listening. And at that point, they'll maybe even feel a little bit guilty because you're being calm and you're actually being firm, but you're being polite and kind and showing that you do want to hear what they have to say. And then usually they'll still be mad, but they'll at least then begin to address the issue instead of just being angry at you. So that's a good way. Let them vent for a minute. And a lot of times you'll hear, they'll tell you what the issue is. Sometimes they don't and they just go on too far and then you kind of got to intervene a little bit with that too and say, hey, you know, I'm hearing you. I'm not, I, I want to help. I, you know, I'm, but I don't know what the problem is yet. What, what is it that you're having a difficulty with? You know, what happened? And then that, you know, signals to them, hey, okay, this, this guy's at least wanting to know what's going on. I'll, I'll tell you, and they'll tell you. And then when they give you, they arm you with that information of what, they're, what dr drove them to those feelings, then you can begin to say, okay. And paraphrasing is awesome. So first thing is to listen. 
number two is to repeat it back for clarity to make sure that you did understand properly, number one. And number two, a double effect, is that it shows them, yes, he was paying attention. Yeah, he does understand. He's hearing what I'm saying. And then that lets you, uh, that gives them a little bit more personal rapport, makes them feel a little bit more at ease, makes them a little more calm because they're getting some progress finally and they're sticking with me and I'm sticking with them. So then um, the next thing would be to empathize with them. Be like, hey, you know, I'm sorry that your internet connection is really giving you a fit. Man, when you're trying to do something and it's super slow and you're frustrated and you've got deadlines, I know you're dealing with something. I've been there, it absolutely, it's a pain in the butt. So I'm sorry you're having that trouble. I absolutely want to get that fixed for you and I believe that we can in pretty short order. Let's get started on that. What's your, do you have your uh, account number handy? And then just go right into the service and you know, and the support of whatever it is. So you can just say, and from start to finish, you know, there's a lot of talking that I'm doing, but the whole process of this is super simple. So it's just let them vent if they need to. Make sure that you're listening to them. If they're not being clear about what they need, ask them a quick question. You know, guide them to giving you the information. And then hear them and say, man, that, that's rough. I'm sorry. Let's fix it. And then whatever your spin or your flavor or your charm is and how to deliver that, that's basically the message every single time. I'm sorry you're going through this. I've been there. It's rough. Let's fix it and then go straight into the fixing that part. And if you want to, if you're looking up something, and, okay, thank you very much for trying. I've got most of it right now anyway. So, um, so that's the main thing, yeah. And then once you're fixing it, if you've got to look things up, and this gives you an opportunity to be creative too. If you can't provide the exact solution that they're looking for due to policies, due to lack of information, due to lack of access, whatever the trouble is, a lot of times, once you've already gotten to this point and you're taking the time to look up the policy, you're looking up their history, what they've called in about before in the notes on the account. And some time is passing. That's a great opportunity while you're doing that if you're able to multitask enough to do it. Like just talk to them a little bit more. Fill that time with, hey, you know, what else is going on? Or especially if they give you anything to work with. Just start with the weather. Be like, man, you know, it's, it's extra aggravating when it's hot too. Is it as hot there for you as it is up here? It's, it's sweltering and humid as heck up here. You know, are you guys doing okay in Arizona or wherever you're at? And then we're, we're trained at very young ages, phone etiquette. And, you know, because you get belted in the mouth if you are inappropriate on the phone to somebody. So we learn, all of us, and we're trained to answer questions. It's almost impossible not to. It's an instinct because it's so ingrained at such a young age so if you ask a customer a direct question, they'll almost, without fail, at least whatever's going on besides that, answer your question. So ask them something. Say something about your weather and then ask them about theirs. And that can fill time, get them talking, buy you some more time, and then just interact with them. And if it goes somewhere, that's going to put them, if you've gotten that far, then they've been progressively getting more at ease with you and by extension your company and your business and your bottom line but more importantly to that they're beginning to trust you more they're beginning to like you personally more and you can become a friend almost and I mean not really a friend but someone that they know that they can go to and they start to believe in you and what you're doing and trust that you can fix their problem and if you can't do it directly that you can figure out how to do it or you'll try your darndest and that alone sometimes is all people need sometimes just the venting is what people need Sometimes after they've gotten done berating you and you've allowed them to, you know, air it out a little bit and then you say, hey, you know, I hear you. I understand. You know, what else is going on? Sir? Is that the only problem? You know, I'll definitely address that. Is there any, what else is happening? Anything else? Because I want to take care of everything that you've got going on. I know that you're in a bad spot. I can hear it. So sometimes they'll end up apologizing to you by the end of it all and be actually happy at the experience of it all because they expected more red tape. And a lot of times that's a really neat thing that people can play off of because I've watched the movies with a certain expectation because of the hype or the talk around it. And then I go to watch it and I'm disappointed. Whereas if I didn't hear anything, I probably would have enjoyed it okay. And the opposite is true too. If I hear really bad things about a movie and then I end up just because my friends are doing it and I watch it with them anyway, 
And I'm like, hey, this is a lot better than I expected it to be because of my expectations. And so then, even if it's just a so-so movie, I actually enjoyed it more, especially if they're enjoying it with me. So expectations mean a lot. So if somebody calls in expecting trouble, but they get you, and you're pleasant, and you're concerned with their welfare and the support that your company is giving and the brand that you're you know, exposing all these people to, that makes a world of difference. And the bar is so low. We've all had so many crummy experiences, especially with telephone customer support. So it's even greater if somebody's in person, if they're in your store. And again, even before it comes to the point where they have to come back for service, right up front when you're dealing with them in the first place, no matter who it is, whether it's a manager. And even if you're the manager, this is great. Like sometimes at Applebee's or, or wherever, uh, Cracker Barrel, you'll have the manager just come around and personally as the manager just say, hey, is your meal okay? How's everything going? Has your server you know, been attentive and everything? And be proactive about it. Find out how things are running. And if there's any trouble, he's right there to hear it personally and try to do something about it. But mostly just reassuring you, letting you know that he's there and he's ready and willing to take care of stuff if need be. And that makes me feel good. I'm like, this, this is nice. That's good service. And I walk away with a, a good feeling about that establishment and will feel good about going back and recommending it to other people. So customer service is 24-7 is and it's easy and it's mostly just about adopting an attitude and taking a few different techniques and ideas about how to interact with people in a positive way and about how to defuse situations and ease them into whatever process you need to get them to a better place. Yeah, it's kind of hard to, when you're in the middle of that and, and you know the customer actually is the one that's wrong, it's kind of hard to turn your mind around on that to, to get to where you need to be with it, you know. Yeah. You can have lots of, and, and we just had a situation where, you know, we have all these guidelines of, of things that we, we follow and you know, Gene said to me recently, people don't read. You know, you can give them all the guidelines in the world, they don't read, and then they're mad. Because something, and so it's, you know, it's a, you know you're right, but it's, and it's not that the, that customer is right, but it is how you can serve them without letting them take over your your own responsibilities absolutely and you can't just come out and say well hey dumb dumb it's right there on page one in black and white point number seven you didn't read it did you you didn't even begin to read it <laughs> well you can <laughs> you can in most cases you can word it a little differently with better effect it kind of depends on who you're serving and what the topic is that's true because you know as a hairdresser I would have people come in and they'd say, I want my hair to do just like hers. Well, you know, I knew their hair wasn't going to do that. So I always said stuff like, I can cut it like that. Here's the result you're going to get, and here's why you're not going to get the same result that they wanted. I can do the haircut, and I'll be happy to, but I just want you to know you know, that what you're asking for, you're not comparing apples to apples. So before we do this, I want you to understand it. And so sometimes I could get around the, you know, the whole customer service situation by going, I just want you to understand that she's got thick hair, you have thin hair. She's got, you know, and, and, and try to make the comparisons and then let them come around to the no instead of me saying it. And that's great because you set expectations. Number one, you tell them, it, you know, there's reasons why you should expect that not to happen the way you're envisioning it. And then two, if they do come back and they're angry, say, hey, this doesn't look like I wanted it to. It's like, well, I understand that. And, and that's what I said. And, and I'm sorry that, that it can't be that way because of your hair type. Is there something else that we can do for you, you know? because that's, that's the best we can do towards that hairstyle. Well, I would always say, I would suggest. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, that's great. Because you're the pro, 
That's why they came in in the first place. So yeah, I would suggest that's really good. And yes and is really good too. It's like if somebody asks you a question and the answer is yes, yes is easy, yes is correct, it's completely fine, but why leave it there if you can say yes and this also and just add like how to how you might want to try cooking pork loin if you like this or even just ask them a question because it's conversational. Would well, you like chili peppers? And then hit them with hey. There's a way that you can add those where if you don't like them even it doesn't change the flavor a whole lot a little bit but it really adds something to the texture and the juiciness that I think you might really enjoy. So if you ever want to be adventurous try this. It's real quick and easy, and it's a good way to cross-sell, get them over to the produce department, and sell them some peppers, too, and actually maybe, hopefully, make them happy. Because you give them something they didn't have before. So yes and is great. Just add something to any yes. Because it's just as effective as if you have to say no. Say no as nicely as you can. Give them extra information to go with it about but, no but. Do yes and as much as you would a no but, because the opportunity is there. To, Make them happy, help them out, give them something they didn't have before. And for free, they get it for free. You know, new information, new things to try. And that just makes them feel really good about you and your company. And Carrie, in real estate, you're talking about big bucks when a customer's not happy, that you either lose the sale or you have to drop the price or something. Absolutely, well, in, in our situation though, we have the realtors as our members so they are our customers because we're providing them education or advocacy or any type of member benefits that's going to help them within their own offices so you know and also the multiple listing service which that's where a lot of the rules are and so it is really hard when you know we have to follow the rules there's not a lot of leeway with it but you know it's, it's all about the delivery and letting them vent, <laughs> maybe even if it takes 45 minutes, but you know, just slowing down, I think, is, is a good thing. Just slowing everything down and really taking the time to, to listen and, and help, but, um, but yeah, they're, it, they're, it can be hard. <laughs> it can be really hard. Sure. Especially when you've got a process that you have to follow. Yes. What, do you have customer service issues that can you think of an example that won't expose who you're talking, what you're talking about? When when people don't understand their bill, that can be a big problem. Mm -hmm. Or they, or they, um, and you're dealing with someone who's more technical, like an accountant type, versus someone who might be a little softer, and um, can give them, you know, more of these tactics. Or if they, you know, don't like where they're housed. I mean, that's their life, you know, for their food, for the internet. You know, those are very common things. Um, we try to keep them very informed. If there is, like, say, Google Calendar went down yesterday for a little while on the risk board, where, but it wasn't our fault. But we emailed out to campus and told everyone, you know, we're sorry this is happening. You know, this is not. Thing, but we acknowledge it's happening and um, you know there's not an update at this time when it'll be resolved but you know we'll keep you updated so just kind of like you know if the internet's not working just not, don't sweep it under the rug you know make it we care we want you to be able to get online and to complete your work do your classes and yeah <laughs> it's some things oh, you can't control but you just have to do the best you can to keep people updated yeah, to let them know that you're actually working yeah. towards it. Follow up. Yeah, so it's a constant battle. <laughs> it it kind of is, you know, like when we put information out for the incubator, I try to make sure we don't use negative words. I never say don't miss the next new yeah. knowledge. I'll say great opportunity coming for the next new knowledge. I try in writing not to use negative words, but Man, I, I said to them the other day, I'm going to have to get a judgment jar instead of a cuss jar <laughs> so that I can quit going, nope, they can't do that because. Because I catch myself saying no, and then I have to go sit down and go, how can I do that? Instead of 
instead of saying, well, let me see what I can do about that. We had a guy that was here one time and they were renting one of the conference rooms and somebody in the group went in the men's bathroom and vomited in the floor. So I immediately, you know, looked at the camera. We saw which three guys it could have been. This is the worst part. They all had on a blue shirt and they all had a beard. <laughs> and they all had dark hair. And so, you know, we talked to the instructor and told him what was going on and they, you know, they were all going, <laughs> wasn't that, you know, and I realized that I probably shouldn't have said anything at all later, but it was too late. I'd already shut off an email and, you know, and, and I, I did apologize, but that just wasn't good customer service. I don't know what else I could have done. Because we had a cleaning lady that had to take care of that, and it was very frustrating. So, how would you handle something like that? Besides panic. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it's fly by the seat of your pants, and some people are more creative under pressure and on the spot, and sometimes maybe it's even easier for me to come up with an idea when I'm forced into it and it's like I've got to deal with this right now my brain just goes out of adrenaline or whatever and it happens and sometimes it doesn't happen quite as well as I want it to and, but I think it's actually harder for me to to operate out ahead of time and, and overthink things I, I kind of have to be under the gun it's just the way I operate I'm like a master procrastinator I literally didn't even start on this like until last night at like 10 o'clock and <laughs> pretty crazy and I put together a pretty big, big presentation as far as slides goes and I'm going to get more into those because I'm remembering them as I'm hearing you guys talking about what these other slides are even though I can't see them but I don't know but I think part of it is however I would have handled it and whatever the words would be part of what would help is just body language because somebody is going to either feel guilty or humiliated potentially at having done that and it was maybe something beyond their control and they don't want to be called out because maybe they're embarrassed and maybe especially in front of anybody that would be extra embarrassing so just maybe try to if you do determine who it is maybe pull them to the side and say hey you know <clears throat> somebody's got to deal with this and I know you didn't mean to I, I know there's no malice here but is there any possibility that you'd be willing to kind of help clean that up maybe you can do it together at least maybe make her life easier and make them feel better about having done it and be less embarrassed because they're like, oh, okay, I can kind of make up for this and give them an opportunity to, in a way, save face. And so potentially that. And as you're doing it, body language has a lot to do with things. Um, there's an SEC rule, and I think it needs a little bit of tweaking, but as I'm doing research and everything, I came up upon this one. And, of course, the first thing is to smile because you want to disarm the person a little bit, especially if it's an awkward situation, and make sure it's a genuine, sincere smile because you don't want to look like a smirk if they're already like in a weird situation. So, so make sure it's sincere and, and begin speaking right away. And don't just smile and look at them for, for two or three seconds in a row because that'll be weird and awkward. So anyway, um, smile. And I learned about this when I did a customer support on the phone and um, telemarketing and things like that. They say, and it kind of makes sense because I've done some like blind tests and watched some videos too where people will say something with a smile on their face and they'll say it without a smile and you can kind of hear a subtle difference and subconsciously you're hearing way more than you would be able to detect just by listening and trying to hear the difference. And they said when I did telemarketing because they gave us all kinds of techniques and tricks to try to how to you know get through the door and win a person's confidence and trust so that you can make this sale and they said that smiling does make a difference and there's lots of studies that bear this out so what they would try to have us do and it's difficult like I tried this at home just smile for no reason for 60 seconds try it for 120 seconds for just two minutes just smile nobody's around there's no pressure it is difficult. It becomes not painful, but like weird and awkward and makes your face feel weird. It's too much, especially when it's not legitimate and you're actually smiling and happy and you don't notice it because so much else is going on. But if you just, <laughs> it, it feels weird. It takes a long time. And you're like, dang, I don't want to quit doing this. I want to quit doing this. But they say 
and, and this uh, for well-being and meditative purposes, uh, studies show that forcing a smile, it's almost like fake it till you make it. If you make yourself smile, the physical act of those muscles does release a little bit of chemicals and endorphin, serotonin, whatever it does, some cocktail, and it's supposed to actually help your mood to some degree just by forcing the smile because it's a physiological response. You're not smiling unless you've got a reason to, the brain reasons to some degree. So smiling will help you sound friendlier, nicer, and more genuine when you're talking to somebody on the phone and they can't see you. And if they can see you, all the better. So smile. The second thing would be eye contact. If you're in somebody's presence, look at them, engage them. You know, let them know that you're there and that you're with them. And you know, don't get weird and just like stare right at them and be intense necessarily. Maybe it's a little bit of an art form, but you know, I, I know you all can do that. And if you can't eye contact with them, listen intently. Listen to what they're saying. It's real easy. The brain is made to fill in blanks. Your brain is always jumping ahead. If you're in a conversation with somebody, especially if you know them at all, you feel like you know where they're going really quickly. As soon as they start to speak, they're going in a direction and you're jumping way ahead probably and anticipating. And it's natural. We all do it. The brain is designed to do that. A lot of times we accidentally do that with customers and think we know what they're feeling and talking about and the direction they're headed way before they've actually spoken it all out. And sometimes we're dead wrong. Sometimes we're just absolutely dead wrong. So give it a chance and be sure that no matter what, even if you are right, even if you have to kind of be patient because you're like, I know what you're saying, you're taking too long, get to the point, I got to get to my next call, come on, man. Do it anyway, listen. And if they're just rambling, you know, that's another, another session about how to actually guide and control conversations and calls and things. But the point is, is listen with intent, pay attention, know what they're saying, and then comment. So after you've heard everything, paraphrase, let them know that you heard them, let them know you understand what they're saying, and in case you didn't understand properly, then they'll let you know. It's like, oh, oh no, yeah, that, but, and they'll kind of clarify for you, like, oh, and that can give you a lot more insight as to the direction you might need to go to help them out the best that you can. So SEC, smile, eye contact, and then comment. And a comment can be anything, especially if you want to build that rapport. And building rapport early on in a conversation, like as soon as you're getting the information and beginning to help them, if you can put them a little more at ease, make them feel like you're just a person trying to help a person. And that's what we all are. Like I worked at the call center and it was really a weird phenomenon to me. I would hear people next to me, they'd be talking just like I'm talking to you now. And then as soon as that beep happened in their headset and somebody's on the line, they're like, hello, this is ho whoever and whoever, and this is what we're doing, and hi. And I'm like, that's weird. You don't talk to people that way. Why are you talking to somebody on the phone that way? So there's some kind of weird expectation of how I'm supposed to come across to a customer. So I'm like, and that was really weirding me out that when people like talk differently as soon as they're in a different situation. So anyway, one thing that helped me be really successful is I literally, and it's just an accident, it's just what I do anyway, is I talk to my grandma and you guys and my sister and customers and the cop pulling me over for a busted tail light. All the same. It's all the same. It's just another person doing whatever they're doing and 99.9% .9 of the time, whoever I'm talking to has no ill will towards me, so I don't have to worry about that. I'm just talking to a person and we're figuring out how we can be as compatible as we can be as we're communicating. So adding that comment in there about, hey, you know, it's hot as a whatever, fill in your own euphemism or, or colloquialism there, and then say, hey, how is it over there in Columbia, South Carolina? I bet it's hot over there. I've been watching the news. And then leave that door open for them to add whatever they want to. And then while you're pulling up the account, you can converse for a second, and it makes a world of difference about how that person feels about the interaction they're having and you personally and then what they'll be willing to do as far as cooperation goes. So SEC, smile, eye contact, and or listening, and comment, just engage with the person. And don't say, I don't know. If you don't know, if somebody asks you a question and you don't have the training, you just simply don't know, don't say, I don't know. Say, hey, that's a great question. Let me find out. I'll put you on hold for a second. That's another thing. Don't ever ask someone if they mind if you put them on hold. Yes, they mind. They absolutely mind. Nobody wants to be on hold. I mean, they've probably already been through some series of events where the like, hold is the last thing they want. So instead say, 
hey, I need just a second. I'll be right back with you. Give me a second. And then put them on hold. It's great. It sets expectations. So instead of asking a question, just make a command. Just be nice about it. Let them not only take a second and then do it. So yeah, do that. Uh, <laughs> say, I'll get the answer. Let me put you on hold. I'll be right back. Body language we talked about. I kind of, oh, here's a cool little story, I think. Use them. We work for Hey, bam. <laughs> OK. This is actually the very one I was just up here about to talk about and clapping about. <laughs> so there was this couple that had been married 40 years. Today was their 40th anniversary. The wife was upset because they weren't leaving on time to get to this fancy restaurant that they had reservations for and they'd really been looking forward to for weeks. They'd really been planning this out and a lot was to follow. So this was the beginning, was this fancy dinner at the fancy restaurant. And she was aggravated at the husband because he was working late. So she's like, he can't, you know, treat this one day and just leave, you know, whatever's going on, come on, we got to go. We're late, this kind of sucks. So they were like 20 or 30 minutes late. And he was kind of upset with her because he's like, I can't help it. You know, we're closing a big deal. This, I wouldn't do it if I didn't feel that I really, really needed to or had to. So they're kind of already at odds before they even show up. And they're 40, 20, 30, 40 minutes late. They're, they're significantly late to this reservation and had to probably go through some rigmarole to maintain the reservation because of how late they were. And they were both like upset about it already, plus kind of at odds with each other. So then the waiter comes over and he begins, uh, I guess somehow he already kind of got wind of what's happening up front and he can see the tension and everything. And I think that they probably already knew why they were there. They probably mentioned it as they made the reservation. And it's a fancy restaurant. So he comes over and immediately begins pouring a bottle of wine for the wife, a glass of wine. And she's in a bad mood and she snaps at him. She's like, what is this? I didn't order this. And then he said, I understand, absolutely not. I know you've had a rough day. This is on the house. And immediately she kind of began to melt because that was completely unexpected. And who normally does that? What experience do you have where a fancy restaurant gives you anything for free? And especially because they saw that you were having difficulty. So that was excellent above and beyond customer service. And it really worked well. And it completely changed the rest of this anniversary for this couple that had been waiting 40 years to have this particular anniversary. So that's great service. And that's not service because service is, here's your food. We thoroughly hope you enjoy and going about your business and make sure they don't run out of drinks. Hospitality is, hey, we're here for you. We'll take care of you. Here's some free wine. Sorry that you've been having a rough day. So that's really great. I love that story. Oh, yeah, and I was just talking about this, too. Don't say, I don't know. Say, hey, I'll find out. Let me put you on hold real quick. I'll be right back. Thank you. And then when you do come back, be sure every single time you ever put anybody on hold or make them wait, if you're going in the back room to check on something, thank you for waiting. Here's what I found. So it's super quick and easy, and it makes a big difference. Every, all these tiny little things add up to be far greater than the sum of their parts. I uh, can't do that. Yes, you can. Uh, it's a company policy. This is crazy. OK, there was a guy that went to some fancy resort, and they were by the pool, and the kids were there, and they were having a fine old time. And then some guy comes up and says, uh, you can't sit here. And the guy's like, uh, uh, it looks like we can. <laughs> we, we have been. And he's like, no, it's, it's company policy. You, you can't sit here. And the guy finds out through his discourse that there was some accident. Somebody fell out of a chair or whatever. But the whole point was is that this guy doesn't care a bit about this other guy's policy. That's, he just handled it poorly in trying to accomplish a goal that he needed to accomplish because it's his job and that's policy and they need to get him out of there. So, and, and the guy on the video, I was watching the guy that had the experience and he said, yeah, well it would have been totally more acceptable and, and maybe I wouldn't have and maybe somebody else wouldn't, but at least they'd be a lot more likely to accept it if the guy said, hey, something happened here you know, just a little while ago. We feel that it's really an unsafe kind of area because of a couple of reasons. We've got a great place over here I think you're going to love. Would it be all right? Let's just move over here because, you know, we want you and your kids to be safe and have a good time. All right? And then hopefully they'll agree to that instead of saying, hey, move. Uh, mind? Oh, yeah, I was talking about that. I was like, mind holding? Who hold? What, what is that? Do you mind holding? No, don't ask them if they mind. They, they do mind. 
tell them to hold and, and then come back and be nice. So this sums up about everything that I feel that this should really be about. Uh, customer service isn't people with problems. It's not you having to deal with people problems. It's not complaints because that does kind of wear on you after a while. And it's easy, especially if you're hearing negative things, we're all human and it's a very rare breed that's really successful, especially with something like telemarketing. And telemarketing to a lesser degree is similar to customer support because you are going to hear people having difficulties and needing help. And so hearing negativity and seeing it and feeling it as negativity wears people down. It's difficult to be successful at especially telesales, but also with customer so uh, support for a lengthy amount of time because most people can't help but take it personally, especially if some people kind of make it personally. And most people can't just get that mindset that, hey, I don't know this person, they don't know me, I'm just doing my job and I really do want to help them and even if they're being a little obnoxious, I don't have to let that affect me. It would be nice if we could actually say that and mean it and it work, but after all it gets to us. So the, the thing is, is if you can just change your mindset to where you don't have to put up with something or have to let something roll off your back that's negative, just see it differently if you're able to. And if, and if you're not able to at first, practice it. Think about it manually, like uh, get a card and put it at your desk that says customer service equals opportunity, because it is. It's not only an opportunity for your employer to make more money and have better experience with the customers, keep them coming back and get referrals, but it's an opportunity for you to be able to be able to handle any kind of negativity, any kind of people and whatever they're bringing at you all the time. It can help with your relationship with your kids, your relationship with your spouse, friends, family, anybody you meet, strangers on the street, trying to make connections and networking. We're all humans and we're all subject to a lot of weird emotional responses and physiological responses. We're weird chemical machines. So just changing manually part of that to see, hey, I've got all kinds of opportunities here and if somebody's really pushing your buttons and you're starting to feel, especially if you can train in mindfulness a little bit to recognize certain signs, like, oh, my heart's starting to go. I notice more often now that I'm paying attention when I begin to start having these negative emotions and anger and frustration, then I can let that be a trigger to, and there's lots of different techniques to become more mindful of how you are feeling and let them become triggers that uh, eventually, if you practice a little bit, become natural, and then you're like, hey, I notice really quickly that I am beginning to become angry. I'm going to become angry any minute now if I don't do something. So in that moment, take a second, reframe, and be like, look, whatever this person's going through, they're going through something right now. They're, even if they're being mean to me personally, it's not personal. They don't know me. It couldn't possibly be personal, even if they really want it to be and really try to make it personal. I don't have to let it be if I can figure out how to really work with my own feelings and emotions and security in myself. I'm just talking to somebody on the phone that needs help. And that's really all it is, and it's an opportunity for me to grow and to be really good at my job, and then maybe advancements for me. I mean, there's lots of ways to look at how much of an opportunity me being able to handle people can be in any and every situation, especially in customer service, because that's your job and you're getting paid for it and you want to keep your job probably and do better in it and advance. So I already started with a little bit of this. Know what the customer wants. So we've got seven main things to help you really understand the mindset of the customer and how to interact with them. One is just know what they want. Sometimes you need to ask them. Sometimes, you, most of the time, you just need to listen. They want you to know what they need. I mean, that's why they're calling. They really want you to know. So basically, the main thing is, is above all else, especially if they've been wading through menus, especially if they've been transferred, the first thing they want, more than anything else in this moment at least, is to be heard by somebody. Gosh, I'm just trying to get through to somebody, anybody, listen to me. And then to be understood, now that I've got somebody hearing my words, are they really hearing it? Are they taking it in? Do they give a crap? Do they understand what I'm going through? So yes, they, hey. I'm sorry about your internet connection. I hear that. I've experienced it. It's no good. Let's fix it. And then to be cared for. They want to know that not only have you heard them, not only do you know what they're saying, but do you give a darn? Do you really care at all about what they're going through? Do you care enough to really try to fix it? Or are you going to shuffle them off or do the minimum amount to do your job and get rid of them? 
And I already mentioned that if you can't do exactly what they want, do all these other things to treat them as well as you can. Let them know that at least you're really putting forth that effort. And sometimes even that will be satisfactory. If you can do anything at all, sometimes even if you can't do anything at all towards fixing the problem in the moment, just trying hard and letting them know that you want to goes a whole long way. And we went over SEC, smile, it's easy. Well, it's not always easy, but unless something's really going on for you in life at that moment, like keeping you from smiling, if it's just any regular day, just do it. Just try to be mindful and practice and think about it and be like, hey, it's an opportunity. It'll be better for me, even if I'm not dealing with people. Just try to be a little happier, smile a little bit more, smell the roses, slow down, whatever it is. Just life can be good, smile some more. Uh, eye contact, look at people, pay attention, listen. They need that. And then just, yeah, weather, compliment. Oh yeah, and this is one. I mean, if you've got something that you specifically like that you can connect to with a person, that's great because it does make it personal. If you see a dude with the Saints hat on, you know, talk about that wide receiver, talk about that linebacker, whatever's going on, just throw that out there, see if they really are a Saints fan or they just inherited that hat from somebody or something. And if they bite on it, then you can really instantly connect with that person and the rest of the experience can go a whole lot smoother and you might even make a good friend because you've got common ground. And then of course, listen. That's one of the biggest things ever. Just because it's number three doesn't mean it's not maybe the most important. It's just the order in which you need to do things. But absolutely, make sure that you hear what they're saying. What do they want? Care about it, fix it. Paraphrase, opportunity. Oh, and this is a good one. It's an opportunity to, to apologize. When you paraphrase, you can add in the apology in the same sentence. I'm sorry you're having speed issues. That's got to suck. Let's fix it. Let's fix it right now. I would hate that to be my situation. So empathize with these people. If you're a CenturyLink customer, you do have that situation. All, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, let them know you've been there. You understand that they're frustrated. You would be too. You have been. Uh, let's see. Further connect with them. Then they feel better about you and your company. We're on the same team. People just trying to help people. I'm trying to help you. I know you need help. Do, 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 do. And more empathy. Empathy is a, a really good thing to do. Let them know that, that you understand, that their plight means something to you. You'd hate to be in that situation. And empathy is a great way. Oh, gosh, this is another big level down for an angry customer. If you can get them to understand and believe that not only you know what they're going through and you've been there, you're just a person. You're not some evil company. You're not somebody that doesn't give a darn. You're just another person that happens to be trying to do their job and your job happens to be somebody that legitimately wants to help you solve your problem today. So just let them know you're just a person and, and that you understand. You really do. And then, of course, find a solution. Sometimes you have to be creative. Sometimes you get to be creative. And again, when you're like consulting policies and looking at their history and stuff, take a, another moment to build that rapport just a little bit more again. You know, talk to them about whatever. Especially, a lot of times, if there's any lull at all while you're pulling up their account, they might be offering information or talking, even if they're not just shooting the breeze with you. Anything that they give you, always be listening to them to the best of your ability, because anything they give you to work with, gives you another opportunity to build connection and rapport and just talk to them on a, on a human level outside of the problem or the process that you're going through. Just add that human element every time you get a good chance without you know, getting too distracted. I remember that was one of my biggest things. My managers would all be, always be walking up behind me and being like, you know, when are you going to wrap up this call? I'd be with this old lady trying to help her fix her internet and I'd be on the phone for like 45 minutes because She's telling me about Uncle Billy, and she's telling me about the kids, and she's telling me about the, the check that she's receiving, and the disability, and this, and the, that, and the grocery situation, and just probably a lonely lady who doesn't have a lot of company, and she finds a nice guy that's willing to listen and really care, seems to care about her, and then does to the best degree that I can to somebody I don't know and haven't seen. But, you know, I am empathetic to her, to whatever she's going through, and she's lonely, so try not to, to fall into that. You know, that was one of my biggest complaints from my, my managers was, you know, you got to control the cause a little bit better. I know you, you don't want to be rude to this old lady, but you got to figure out how to move on. <laughs> and sometimes, 
you know, a customer's not going to be satisfied no matter what you do. And even if they would be satisfied, sometimes you just don't have a solution available that will fix the situation that they have. And sometimes they just need a full refund. And a lot of times when it comes to that, if you've already gone through most of this other process and you've tried and you've listened and, and you can't come up with solutions, and the manager isn't going to be able to either, or you are the manager and they, you've been transferred to and you're the last stop, then um, just a lot of times it's in your best interest to just go ahead and do that. Now, I'm not advocating, and I know you don't want to start losing money a lot and just giving in to that, but sometimes it really is a, a thing that you need to do. And hopefully that's going to be a rare thing. That hopefully that's going to be a really rare thing that you come up against a roadblock that you can't figure out and you have to give a refund or if it's just a person that that's all they're concerned about, they've just had it, they don't care, or they're just a nasty, rotten, lonely person, whatever the case is, that they're not accepting any solution that you could provide, just give them the refund and let them go because there's not much you can do with a person that's not willing to be helped. So go ahead and do that, and, and if it's not a rare thing, then goodness gracious, you've got other problems you need to either A, hire you a third party customer support team that deals with things because your customer support is no good or get a trainer to come in and, and train you how to do customer support because if you're giving away refunds all the time because you can't figure out better solutions you're going to go under you got to fix that you got to fix that quick clarify we've talked about that makes and, and this is after you found a solution even if you've already implemented it and fixed whatever it is in the computer that need fix or have a plan to have a customer rep come out, if you found the solution, then recap that with them really carefully and make sure and ask them directly if you need to, say, hey, is this, does this solve your problem today? And then of course in a minute ask, is there anything else I can do? But mostly, see if they're satisfied with the solution. Just ask them outright because a lot of times you may assume and think because it makes sense to you that the problem is solved and therefore the customer is satisfied. Sometimes they're absolutely not. That's not what they were looking for. They were looking for a different solution. Whatever the situation is, doesn't matter. If they're not satisfied and you don't know about it and they aren't going to say anything about it because of any number of reasons, they're going to say something to Angie's List. They're going to say something to Facebook and to Yelp and to Twitter and wherever else. And that's what you don't want because you have the opportunity to keep that from happening by simply at the end of it all say, hey, is this seems like we've, we've come to a good solution here. We'll implement that right now. Things are going to be good. And then give them expectations. It's going to be on within an hour. And then see if that's satisfactory. And if it is, awesome. You've done it. And then you can move on. If not, figure out what part's dissatisfactory and, and try to fix that too. Fix everything right now. And then follow up. This is something that probably hardly any company does that I know of. Uh, some now, especially if you do an online chat kind of thing, that they'll, say, they'll send you an email saying, hey, take this quick survey to see how I did, and that's how customers, you know, get the, or the uh, reps get their support and, and uh, ratings and stuff. But as much as that, it gives you an opportunity and contact information where if you weren't satisfied, you can reach back out and say, hey, you know, I thought everything was good, but I had this one more question, and just shoot them a quick email, and hopefully they'll respond because they already sent you something back through an email. Phone call is awesome. If you are a smaller business or if you simply have time or if somebody either made a comment on your website or called or sent a, uh, a comment card saying, hey, I had a good experience and wants to let you, it was good enough that they want to let you know that it was good, then by golly, capitalize on that. Reach back out to them and say, thank you very much for, for letting us know that we, we met your expectations or exceeded them. We really appreciate that. And then give them a little bonus. I did that one time. There was a lady, I went through the drive through and I can't remember if it was, I think it was McDonald's. And she was just super nice, super duper nice. And then at the drive through window, just so nice, so nice in fact, that I felt compelled. I got out of my car, I walked in there, and I asked to see the manager. And the manager came out and I said, I can't remember her name, it's been lots of years ago, but like Margaret did an awesome job. She is doing so wonderful. She made me feel so good, she is so nice. She is on top of it, and I just wanted you to know. And his response to me was to give me, uh, I got a free burger out of it. He's just like, thank you so much. That's how we decide on promotions. That's how we decide a lot of things is by feedback. And if somebody's having such a good response that they don't even just fill out a comment card, but they come ask to see me, hey, that, that means something to me. So here, here's a free burger. And I'm like, I didn't expect that. That was awesome. And they didn't expect me to 
to be nice and awesome and say thank you for, for such good service. So it was a really good experience in every way. And then if somebody had, you know, to call in, they had some difficulty, regardless of the level of severity and how they felt about it, if they had to reach out, that was some effort on their part. There was some difficulty. So if you do have some way to flag everybody that's gone through the customer service support system, especially if you can automate it, just add them to some mailing list and then send that out with just a little bit of extra verbiage, even if you already had like a 5% discount that you're going to send to everybody in your database, we'll just change a few words on theirs and say, hey, you know, I understand that you recently reached out to us. I hope that your experience was good. If not, let us know. If it was great, let us know. And here's an extra 5% off your next purchase as a way to say thanks for staying with us through whatever difficulties you've been having. And hopefully you won't have any more difficulties. We appreciate you. Thanks a lot. Come see us. And so that's a great way to, to add value. And if you've already got something, if, if you're worried about, and this is a potential pitfall of that, if I send you out a 5% discount, but I'm also sending everybody else a 5% discount, and you talk to your sister or your brother or whoever, and you find out, oh, well, this is just kind of fake and kind of bs -y. This is disingenuous because they're sending everybody out, and they're acting like they send it to me as a special thing. So if you're at all worried about that, then give them 10%. Like, do something that is genuine. Give them a little bit more than you give everybody else and, and be honest about it. And then drip campaign is something we should all be doing about everything if it fits our model. And that is just the same thing, basically, except on a regular basis, send out these contacts just to be in contact, but send out your promotions and things like that. And anybody that's involved with customer service on you know, the receiving end of needing service, make sure that you address that in your little email. Say, hey, thank you very much for reaching out. We appreciate you staying with us. Loyalty means a lot to us. So any, any more questions, comments, anything you want to know or talk about? Or? say one thing that I have used because my time is valuable <laughs> and I don't have a lot of it sometimes because uh, there's a lot of things coming in and out but one way that I try to give that personal touch is I use a service called fly dial where I don't necessarily have time to do a 45 minute phone conversation because a lot of them like to talk and catch up but I'll at least like use the slide dial so it, if it's on a cell phone it'll call and leave a voicemail and the way you tailor it it's like oh I hate I just missed you you know kind of a thing but it doesn't actually ring their phone it just leaves them the voicemail mm -hmm. so then they're kind of like oh you know yeah, oh I hate I miss that I hate I miss that you know but I, you know and then you know they can either call back or whenever they have time or hopefully it's at a time I have more time to talk you know, but that's been a lifesaver sometimes. That's I don't neat. have time to talk to a lot of people. <laughs> this sounds maybe kind of awful, but it the first sounds, thing my, it does sound awful, well, but it really, No, not that. That sounds wonderful. Oh, okay. That sounds beautiful. <laughs> what, what happened in my brain that this maybe sounds a little bit awful is that uh, I could maybe think of some relatives or friends that that would be it, awesome to employ. Well, I'm... <laughs> Because somebody yeah, I want to reach out to, them let them know I'm thinking about them. I do want exactly. to contact, exactly. but maybe sometimes I don't want to spend that 45 minutes in that moment. <laughs> or an email, you know, because they can actually hear your voice, but it took no time at all. To Sly dog, I like that. Yeah, Sly dog. <laughs> Great service. There is fees attached to it, but I'm telling you, it's, it's been a lifesaver. Right on. I wondered why I was getting voicemails for different things, and then it was never ringing. Yes, well, that, that could be why, because they don't have time to talk to you. Now that I let the secret out of the, you know, out of the bag, don't get mad at him for it. But. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might have had my phone do not disturb. Sometimes I, well, I'm terrible at listening at my own voicemails, but, you know, in the realtor world, they rely on those voicemails, and sometimes it just comes across a lot better. Um, actually hearing from you than a text message or an email. Now, yeah, speaking about that, that's something that maybe would be an entirely separate session, but are there any tools that any of you have heard of or used when in relation to customer service specifically that have been helpful or anything you've even heard of that somebody else has used other than SlideDog? Because we all just heard about that. So is customer service a, a relatively new thing for any of you as far as like uh, 
being on the giving end of customer service or has anybody had any real experiences with either positively or negatively and, and learned from experiences that have helped you maybe change about how you deliver customer service or is everybody kind of new to it or not even in it yet or I wouldn't really say new to it but I'll, I'm always willing to improve so you know, sometimes just taking a minute to get out of the office not hear the cell phones and the work phones and the faxes and all that and just you know doing presentations like this just to refresh reset you gotta you gotta do this because yeah. you know it, it really would hurt our business if we upset all of our realtor members because there's other associations that they go to so you know if we don't provide that customer service you know the only way we are in business is because they are our member if they're not our member we don't have an association so right. i mean it's it's a very high priority it's right on. the utmost priority and you're exactly right that's kind of the point of, of a lot of this is that even for companies through whatever means it wasn't as important before even if you don't realize it, it is becoming more important and it should be more of a priority to make sure that, that it's good and you get it right. And I think something like um, if you have a Facebook page, if you have one of those canned responses if somebody sends a message to you, I think it's pretty personal. Uh, and you, that's something that I, when people ask me what advice, I say take that off. If have your have a notification set on your phone that someone sends you a message on Facebook on your business page that you automatically respond to that than having that can pitch. The main, I just think it's kind of a personal, they're connecting with you for a reason. And if it's saying, hey, it's after hours or I'm on the road or I'm traveling, I'm out of town, but I'll get back with you on such and such a day instead of that can thing. Uh, or no one's available at this time. We will review and get back with you. Yeah, and that becomes more easy too with tools like I'm trying to figure out how to leverage my phone more to not only keep schedules and because I'm becoming more and more busy as time goes on and it's easy to double book myself or forget about something and then be in hot water. But uh, to also try to figure out how to make it easy to set reminders with my voice because if I'm driving or just busy, it can be really cumbersome. All the, it seems easy and it's way easier than it used to be. but the tap and the time is just frustrating and, and I'm very distractible and if I can just say hey phone remind me on June 22nd I got to be at this place at this time and then if it'll do it and it's in there and then all I have to do later is look at it and I'm like oh hey it did it right and then if I can say hey and be sure to remind me five days ahead and three days ahead and two days ahead and 45 minutes before because I, I need that kind of thing. Now, Siri can be your best friend. Your personal I don't have a Siri I have a Google. <laughs> but it <laughs> sort of works. Yeah. <laughs> for the training of customer service for Food City, does that live in its own department or is that like a human resources thing? Does marketing work with those folks? As far as I can tell, it seems like the entirety of the customer service department is about three or four people that are in the same area that I'm in. So the marketing and advertising and the loyalty department are all just kind of about 25 people in the same general area. And I don't know if there's any specific training or not. And like annually, we've got a manager's training. So that I think pretty much everybody in turn goes through the same kind of manager training that the people at the store level would actually go through. So at corporate, we at least kind of understand the concepts of what these people are dealing with as far as human resources and managing customers and managing each other and employees and things and what that means and how to do it and it's very very important so other than that training I don't know if there's any training specifically for um, for anything else there probably is here and there and we have a thing called fast track where there's tons of videos and they add stuff and it's actually like on a timeline it's like you're expected to complete this uh, video training within a certain amount of time and then there's a test afterwards so you have to answer questions based on that video to you know see if you've retained it and make sure that you did it and then you have like some permanent score on there if you got six out of ten I think it 
sometimes either gives you a chance to retake it once, some of them it doesn't. And we have to do things like that annually too to make sure that we're re-upped on knowledge about how to use fire extinguishers, fire escape plans, uh, how to handle dangerous materials, sexual harassment. So we have to go through training like that all the time. But as far as strictly customer support, we've got an awesome customer support team because one of them just came from the stores and that's, she loves doing it. She legitimately lives to help people. She's just a wonderful person and really, really good at all this just as natural to her. She just is a customer sports machine. And so I guess she just came in, we've just gotten lucky, I suppose, enough to have a good enough staff to where maybe they just came in off the street with enough experience and training that they didn't need training. And I haven't heard about or know about because it's not directly my, my department, even though we work kind of closely. I don't know if they, they have intermittently things that they go to, like little seminars and trainings to keep up on whatever's going on, like a thing like this potentially. You kind of start from the top and then it goes down. You know, it's like you got to make sure every level is communicating with one below and making sure yeah. that they're all doing the things that they need to be doing to make it grand. Yeah, and I don't know if this is uh, how common this is because I've been at this place so long and before that I did basically a lot of freelance type stuff for so long that I may be a little bit out of touch about uh, the norms for training and, and how things trickle down as far as knowledge goes. But um, it seems like it's just a direct line and, and the, the company just trusts these people that they're doing it right because of the results that they're getting. If they're not hearing customers complaining beyond that or asking for managers or writing letters, then they know that these people are doing their job right. So I guess they just take that on faith that these guys are good and, so it really doesn't kind of filter down about brand either because they're obviously doing a good enough job on that too. And there may be opportunities now that you say that, that if we really want to try to, to take advantage of every marketing opportunity and customer interaction that we could, we could potentially try to add specific things in there about like mention the brand when you're on the phone or, or I don't know exactly what that would look like. There would be meetings and papers and stuff before any of that would be implemented, but potentially. And one thing that I don't think would benefit us and I don't think we'd ever do just because it's not have a good feeling for us, but a lot of companies will do that, especially phone companies. If you call in customer support, then at the end of things it's like, hey, we've got a good deal on whatever or hey, would you like to bundle a phone with that and try to up sell you a little bit. So. There's always potential for that in any company that doesn't already do it or to improve on that. But other than that, I don't see any real trickle down for us in particular. That's good. Which is neat. Even have a it's unique. Department. Yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> I mean, that's a great thing. I was like, loyalty department. That's <laughs> awesome. I mean, that's their job <laughs> is to make sure that people keep coming back. Yeah, to take care of problems yeah. and make sure that their car, their value car is working right and that the discounts, you know, if they're fuel bucks discount if the pump didn't work right or you know just whatever to make sure that all that is well oiled and maintained and then to also come up with different promotions and then I'm involved directly with a whole lot of that like designing the actual receipts that print out that says hey you know here's some discount on your Dollywood tickets or the NHRA drag drag races come see those with a food city purchase you get like a five dollar discount on on that and so that's a, because there's a lot of graphic design that goes into these things that I guess people don't think about, but that's all in the loyalty department too, keeping people coming back by having receipt messages and things they like that. Feel good because you're taking care of them and helping them in other ways. Just like mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's part of that community thing too, and just one of our pillars that we we rely on to try to set ourselves apart from Kroger or Publix or whoever else is not just sell groceries, but to be people, people. Folks, we're out of time. I want to thank Fallon for doing this for us. Uh, this today concludes our 2018-2019 series, and we're going to take July off, but we're going to start in August. And actually, our first one in August is How to Airbnb. We're Ooh, finding me. in Southwest Virginia, this is a great opportunity for folks that have properties that are sitting empty, that maybe they inherited or they have... 
uh, bought a home that has an extra space or whatever it is, so they're looking for ways to make uh, additional income. Um, Airbnb is a good fit, especially in far southwest Virginia where we don't have enough lodging to support the tourism development. You know, you can make 3000 to 5000 more a month uh, with if you run your Airbnb right, if you've got the property um, getting it out there. So I want to go, I'll be actually leaving that session and kind of walk you through is how do you set up uh, on Airbnb and some things to look at. But we have a great lineup from starting in August through June of next year. And I was telling someone just this morning that I'm proud of this program because now we're getting entrepreneurs, business owners coming to us and say, we want to lead a session for us. So we're not out knocking on the doors and begging people. And I think that goes with the caliber of folks, um, folks like Fallon that have um, donated their time to do this session because you can't beat the price, right? And, um, you know, don't forget, if you like this, tell others, but also we stream those, these sessions and archive those up in YouTube. It's at youtube.com forward slash new knowledge. So we have sessions all the way back from 2015 where um, uh, uh, Jim at the, at the Bristol Hurl, Maxwell, uh, led a session on how you develop a press release. That's the publisher and editor of the Bristol Public Courier from all kinds of subjects on setting up QuickBooks to different social media. So there's a great archive of programs out there that can help you. And I appreciate the collaborative efforts of the incubator for, for um, providing the space, but also for the Washington County Chamber of Commerce. We've been working together on this uh, since 2014. Um, and uh, we just want to see other folks take advantage of these programs. So thanks again for coming. And I look forward to seeing you in August. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank and thank you very much for helping me with my difficulties. <laughs> Oh, that's all right. Oh, man. I just gave... Uh,